Hello and welcome to the first video of section 1.6 on limit laws. In this video we will discuss fundamental limit laws that will aid in calculating limits. In section 1.5 we use graphs to get an intuitive understanding of limits. We visualize the limit at a point as the height of two ants crawling from the left and right when and if they meet. If you need to review, rewatch section 1.5 before continuing. This section will move beyond graphical understandings to more algebraic approaches. How can we calculate the limit of f as x approaches 1 without graphing the function? Well, could we plug in 1 to find this limit? Not quite. As we saw in section 1.5, the limit and actual value do not have to equal each other. Our informal and graphical understanding is not sufficient or rigorous enough to be used in calculating the limit. To be honest, we're not going to treat limits in a truly mathematically proper way. If we were doing things rigorously, we'd start with the formal definition of a limit, and then use it to carefully develop our techniques. If you would like, you can read a little bit more about it in section 1.7, and if you take Math 478 in a few years, you'll learn this approach. The problem is, this kind of strictly mathematical approach requires a lot of mathematical training. That's why we don't teach it until Math 478. Instead, we'll focus on intuition and tools necessary for Calc 1. The following limit laws are derived directly from the formal definition of a limit. As we learn these laws, keep in mind that the limits of f and g exist. These laws are only guaranteed to hold if the limit of both f and g exist. The constant limit law states the obvious. If a function always outputs 5, then the limit to any x value will be 5. The identity law has similar reasoning. If y and x are always the same, when x approaches a, then so does y. If the limit of f exists, then the constant multiple law says that a constant can be multiplied to the function before or after the limit is taken. Since we know the limit of f exists, 4x approaches 12 as x approaches 3. If the limits of both f and g exist, then the sum and difference law says that functions can be summed before or after the limit is taken. Since we know the limits of x and 7 exist, x plus 7 approaches 9 as x approaches 2. Similar to the sum law, the product law states that functions can be producted before or after the limit is taken. Since we know the limit of x exists, x squared approaches a squared as x approaches a. Similarly, the limit of x cubed is a cubed, the limit of x to the fourth is a to the fourth, and the pattern is true, the limit of x to the n is a to the n for a number n. This fact continues to be true for general functions, if the limit of a function exists, a function can be multiplied to itself n times, or have a limit taken, in any order. And we can tweak this pattern slightly. Instead of taking powers, we can be taking roots. This is a fact that is provable once we're in section 1.8. Our final law, the quotient law, states that a quotient can be taken before or after a limit, provided that the limit in the denominator is non-zero. Can you think of a reason why we need this condition? Let's finish with an example. Is the denominator's limit 0? Well, let's calculate it. We know that the limit of x squared and the constants 5 and 1 exist, so we can use the difference law and then take the limit into the square root to find that the limit of the denominator is 1. So the limit of the denominator is not 0, and we can break the limit into the fraction. We've already calculated the limit of the denominator, but what is the limit of the numerator? Well, the limit of x squared and 3 exist, so we can calculate the limit using the sum law and find that the limit is 12. Now that you have the basics on limit laws, be sure to strengthen your understanding through practice.